So let's see. So today we are just going to be going through briefly um, chapters four and chapter five um, of the book. So um, it's supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Um, the book has these very, very detailed chapters and like actually getting into like the mathematical theory behind the different clustering algorithms and the different reasonings behind picking each method or like each correction. Um, but I wanted to briefly today just run through the different methods um, with it. Um, and I can show you all the place where I go, at least on YouTube, to really learn um, some of these um, machine learning techniques. And I just think it's really helpful. He breaks it down way better than I could explain it. Um, so with that, I think we can get started. Um, and then I think at the end, when we finish running through um, these two chapters, we can kind of discuss how we want to set up going forward, because that'll actually be where the genomics material is starting. And we can break down, we can actually start making new uh, slides for those parts. All right, so let me pull this up. So um, I will start with the clustering here. So um, they're saying for chapter four is just unsupervised machine learning. So primarily this is um, clustering dimension reduction, like PCA, CSE, um, things like sorry, that. Sorry, Alison? Yeah. Do you have slides? Because we don't see it, or I don't oh, see Oh, I need it. to share my screen. That would, <laughs> that would be helpful. Thank you, Anne. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, so the um, chapter four, yeah, basically looking at um, clustering and dimension reduction. Um, the slides I have for the previous, um, the actual like shared book slides, um, the YouTube channel that I really, really like is called StackQuest. Um, and he's got, he breaks it down really simply. Um, and he does this for all kinds of um, statistics and um, other like machine learning techniques. So and I think he's really help. I think he's really helpful. He's actually a, um, a bioinformatician himself. He's a I think describes himself as a statistical geneticist. Um, so I think the StatQuest page is super super helpful. So if you haven't checked this out before, I would highly recommend it. He's got everything you want. He also has some examples where he does this in R. He does it in Python. Um, just Fantastic. I cannot recommend this channel enough. So I will get back to our work um, and get back to the book. Okay. So going on the first example in chapter four, um, clustering the groups based on the different similarities or based on their similarities. Uh, we want to group in this, in the example, we would be doing um, genes, like how similar are their expressions to one another? And there's different ways to go about doing this. Um, essentially, um, what they are describing here in this first part is the distance metric. So like basically how similar the genes are to one another. And there's different ways you can calculate it. Um, the most common ways are going to be um, it's something called the Manhattan distance or the L1 distance or the Euclidean distance or the L2. And the Manhattan distance is where um, the Manhattan distance uses, like, if you put all of the samples together, it's just calculating, like, from the center how far away they are. And then um, the Euclidean distance is doing something with the sum of squares where you're actually, like, plotting. Um, if you're drawing it like this and you're plotting, you've got boop, 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 and you're actually taking... Um, the sum of squares from this as opposed to this would be L2 and then L1 distance is more or less measuring the distance to the center of all of these and then taking the difference from that. So they're both, both ways are totally valid to do it. It's just a matter of which way um, Really, when it comes down to it, it's just a matter of which way best describes your data for it. It's not so much like this, it can only be done this way or only be done that way. That it just, um, when you're fitting and you're performing these analysis, it's really just um, which one helps best describe your data, um, which is 
helpful in the sense that like you can't go wrong but also in the sense it's like okay well i just want to do it one way you can't really just do it one way you really just have to try a bunch of different ways to do it and then they go on to describe some other different means of doing it um oh and then doing it in r um just the distribution function and then you would then specify what method whether it's manhattan or euclidean um the they have another method the correlation distance um Sometimes you might need to scale your data. So if the data are away, um, you know, if you've got some data that are, let's say like values of like 10, 20, 30, and then you've got other values in that same data set that are in the thousands or 10,000s, it may help to scale the data so you can accurately um, see the difference as opposed to having it be skewed by those data points that are very, very far away from the rest because they are much larger or much smaller than the others. Um, Another uh, method of uh, clustering is the hierarchical clustering. Um, and instead of it just giving, so when we did the Euclidean distance and the uh, correlation distance, those are physically giving like numbers, but you can also kind of visualize it using um, hierarchical clustering. Um, and this will show you as a dendiogram, like how closely related the two values are. And you can take uh, using the distance metrics before. So like the Euclidean distance or the Manhattan distance, how far away things are. And so in the example given here that patient three and four are more are more closely related than patient one and two. Um, that would be from the clustering dendiogram. And to do it, it's um, the h -clust, um command. Um, and there's different methods of clustering and like how they're merged together. And again, without going too much into the mathematical background with it, um, it really, when you're working with your data, it may just depend on uh, what helps to best fit your data. They all calculate it in slightly different ways. Um, so another clustering method they have. So that was hierarchical clustering. Um, another method, um, oh, just this is the example that they give um, using clustering to um, classify different types of leukemia uh, based off gene expression, which is something that we would be commonly doing in genomics. Um, and they use hierarchical clustering to group the different sets together. Um, and then to generate this heat map based off of gene expression um, and the leukemia type. Um, and so if you were to generate this graph um, and you did the clustering in different methods, you could do, um, you could, if you changed the clustering methods or the clustering distance and how it was collected, are determined. Um, if you change these, you would get different graph outputs. Um, and I think I actually I might have this shown on. Um, oh, these are the exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, part of the exercises of chapter four. Let me see if I can zoom out some on this. Yeah, so here I the first heat map I made was the ward D2 and then the with Euclidean distance, and then I changed it from ward D2 to ward D, and it's um pretty subtle, but there are some changes in like the expression and the clustering. Um the for the most part it's gonna be the same, but some of the genes, how they were expressed are slightly different and not to say that either of these is incorrect it's really up to us the end user to determine which method best represents our data um, and i did it again a third way um i personally thought this one was the best um expression uh because if you see here like some of these some of the um cml groups with the um non-leukemia uh no leukemia group were kind of mixed together um, with some of these, and then this one actually was able to cleanly cluster the patients without leukemia um, apart from the other uh, leukemia types. And then, so again, it just goes to show that how you cluster and the method that you use um, can affect the data and how they're expressed. Um, 
Allison, can I ask some questions as a super novice? Yeah, absolutely. So how do you make these decisions? Like, like saying you choose the clustering that kind of best matches our hypothesis feels circular. Um, yeah. So are, are there like standards within questions or within types of genomics data or basically <laughs> is yeah. there a, a more data driven and less hypothesis driven way to decide which clustering is most appropriate? Uh, yes. So um, they do have, so I'm going to go in the next example I have, um, k-means clustering, which is where you can actually determine the number of groups to generate. Um, and you can, from there, uh, let me go back to that. Yeah, to answer your question, somewhat yes. <laughs> uh, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, so with k-means clustering, you can, um, figure out how many uh, points to partition. When some of it, like with this example, when they had like the different types of leukemia, um, you know, that makes it somewhat simple to cluster it that way. But in terms of actually generating, if you don't know how many uh, clusters to make, um, we can go to the k-means clustering. Um, so the, as I said, it's to determine the number of centeroids, um, and to do that, um, in R, the um, it's just the k-means command. Um, we're going to scroll down some more. So, yes, there is a way to do it. Some of it is also kind of like, again, the hypothesis driven and sort of it seems kind of up, in, not up in the air, but not easy enough to determine, but there are some ways to go about it a little bit more, um, more defined. And one way that they recommend is to, um, they say something like to determine like the, the silhouette, uh, which is something I, I didn't quite fully grasp myself, but basically um, in plotting this, how well do the data match um, each other? Um, and without, again, I, I can't really explain the, the mathematical background. I didn't quite fully comprehend it, but essentially the way that I interpreted this plot was that um, the number of clusters you have, um, these should be like in a, when you've got the correct number of clusters made when you're making this plot, again, this is, a, not something I'm totally comfortable with, but um, as compared to some of these other clusters where you've got, you know, some values off to the side, um, a lot of range um, within your values of the the silhouette width, so like how well it matches or doesn't match the data when you're like centering it. Um, the one with five um, has the smallest width between all of the the points and so that would be um how you could choose okay like this is how i need five points compared to something like this where you've got um a pretty big spread or particularly like in with four points you know you've got a spread of almost um 0.5 over like almost half of it so um, that's one way to choose it a little bit more empirically um can uh can we say here that the value s so the bigger the value s i is uh the more yeah so this 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 is the silhouette width so the bigger this is uh, the more likely is it that it's it is the same uh, the correct or the best number of clusters yes yeah because i think okay. they're showing up here that um the silhouette values range from negative one to one where the values that are positive indicate that the data point is well matched to its own cluster um mm -hmm. so yeah closer to one it is that means that yeah it's matched to the cl its cluster so okay. yeah, you want it to be as close to one as possible, which I think is not obviously realistic, but trending yeah. close to one. I didn't know about this before, and I think it's uh, at least uh, worth a try. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and like I said, I'm always I... struggling with this, like, what, should, like, how many clusters should I have? And I'm just playing around with the resolution, and but I never, I'm never sure, like, how many clusters 
are in the end the correct number. <laughs> right, right. Um, so this is something that, like the problem that Keith was saying, like how do you choose the number of clusters? Yeah. Is this something that you fre you frequently encounter? Like you're just kind of picking and choosing for the most part. Yeah. All right. So that's one method. Um, oh, and the elbow plot. This is what I um, this is what I think is really helpful. So they did the different K, um, the average silhouette value for all of these different um, points. And then they actually can plot the points here. Um, and this is called an elbow plot where they, okay, you've got your average silhouette value for all the different points. So two, three, four, and then it drops down dramatically at five and then picks up a little bit more at six and seven. So this crook of the elbow where this is happening, this is, um, likely showing the best like this this elbow here that's um the I op the optimized number of clusters to create um so I think it's a little bit more um I think this is easier to understand than the plot like this so this is just showing all of the silhouette plots in each of the individual points um, but this is actually just showing the average silhouette point. So these numbers generated here um, on the side. And I think um, when you look when you look at something like this, oh, you see the that elbow crux. Um, I want that point at five. <laughs> oh no, they're saying here that the best value is four based off the highest peak. But then when we look at it here, we get five. Um, I think that first plot is showing for each of the five clusters in the five cluster solution. Oh, okay. So like there's there's basically it rather than that that being five subplots, it's actually sixty individual lines within the five cluster solution. Okay. With yeah. So like in that first one, the that first number after so it says one colon twelve. Mm -hmm. saying there's basically 12 items that would be classified in cluster one. Okay. Got and it. And so at the very bottom there, it has the average silhouette width is 0.23. Mm -hmm. And so that's what is getting plotted on the um, the elbow plot. Yeah. Yeah. And so in this case, they would say that you should take k equals four. Um, because it's the highest. You want the highest, because that, that, that silhouette value, it looks like based on the formula is basically maximizing the greatest distance between a point and other clusters versus mm -hmm. the distance between points within a cluster. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah Cause I, this is where I started, it started going over my head um, to be totally honest. So. Um, yeah, no, this is, yeah. Very yeah. complimentary. Like the, this is where I feel very much most comfortable. So. Okay, good. Um, but this doesn't start to help answer your question of like, okay, how do we actually pick a number of clusters to make and not just when you're doing hierarchical clustering, like, oh, I'm going to try four clusters, I'm going to try six and just see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I think this helps with that. It's, it's still, I mean, I guess for like the other kind of more qualitative ones, like where it's not choosing between how many clusters, but it's choosing between like which clustering, dist like which distance metric to use. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm just curious, like, I mean, I guess you could still do something similar, right? So you could say, let's look at something like the silhouette value for using Euclidean versus using Manhattan distance. Right. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you could generate these plots again and then based off the two different variants and then you could best compare. Okay, so basically yeah. it's like a, a way of looking at an overall fit statistic and just saying like, what seems to be the best overall statistical fit. Right, right. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then they go on to, in great detail, describe the gap statistic. Um, and this is like the variation within a cluster. Um, so that's what the gap descriptor um, 
statistic is describing. Um, so the um, how much variation um, is seen between uh, groups based off like the number of clusters uh, generated. Uh, this is the formula that they use to generate it. Um, I cannot describe this to you if I'm being totally honest. Again, this is the part where it's just going over my head. Um, but the clustering data, um, to see the gaps and the amount of variation between the um, within the clusters. Um, so here, how they're describing this, um, the gap descriptive of k equals seven is the the best value because it's got the highest gap statistics. So like the closer to one the gap number is, um, the less variability there is between uh, the cluster within the cluster. Um, but they'll say here, if you notice after six, it pretty much becomes, it levels off. Um, and so what they would say, they would pick the smallest K value uh, based off this simulation, where it's, you know, at six points, it's pretty level. It's not really increasing. Um, so here they would say they'd pick K of six. Um, so, when they say here using this procedure gives us k equals six is the optimum number of clusters, but they know there's five main patient categories, but this does not mean that there are no subcategories or subtypes of the different cancers. So there may be within one of those cancer types that they're saying that like it really could be split into two different groups. And that's what um, this k of six would be sort of meaning to indicate. And so that's another these are all different, just different methods of choosing K. And to me, what I take away from this is that there's no one best method. There are some ways you can kind of formally deduce which is the best K, but there's no exact right or wrong answer. Um, it, it goes down to the question that you were looking to answer biologically that would help determine the number of clusters to make. Um, so they've got a bunch of different other clustering methods shown. Um, if you really want to go into them, they're in the NBCLUST library. So that's all the first half of the exploratory data analysis. Secondly, is going to be actually visualizing it and so reducing the data. Um, so one of the most common methods of doing it is uh, principal component analysis. Um, and with PCA, um, you have the example they're starting off with, you have the expression of two different genes um, here of this PGYL and the CD33 across all the different leukemia patients. And what PCA is going to do is that it essentially is, uh, that's what I described this in like one sentence lineup. The, um, the variance of the data is then um, categorize so in your PC1 in your first dimension. Oh my goodness, C1, I'm just gonna call it two. Um, in your first dimension, how much of the variability in the data set can be explained and be reduced from multiple dimensions into one dimension? That's gonna be your PC1, and that's gonna be your um, what's gonna have the most. Uh, variability and then your PC2 is going to have the second most availability. So how can you reduce this multi-dimensional plot into a um, singular dimension um, or 1D at a time? Um, and so with doing this, um, essentially you're drawing in here and you're seeing like the distance between all the different points to the, you know, the line of best fit, your sum of squares, and you're reducing it uh, down to that. The stat quest video is that I've linked um, are describing this better than I can describe it. And he describes it very succinctly. So I really recommend watching that. Um, the To calculate PCA in R, just the, the primcon function, um, they have these, I think I have actually in the examples, I've got some better. Um, 
yeah, it's, it'll be a little bit easier when we go to describe it with actually like using all the data and not just um, just two genes. But here I've got, you know, I plotted all the data with all of the genes expression and like looking at this, okay, this doesn't really tell you, you can't make it any particular trends about this data so far. Um, however, when you do, and when you do principal component analysis and you're breaking it down all the different dimensions, um, the first two components are only 5% and 3%. They only can explain 8% of the variance between all of that data. Um, and when, so when you look at it with a subset of the genes, um, and you're looking at two genes specifically, when you plot those, okay, yeah, that's when you can start to see there's some um, variation between the groups. It's a little bit easier to distinguish it. Um, and when you're making, when you're doing the dimension reduction, um, and you can start to see some of the variance um, how it's plotting it it's like the i'm not doing this well this morning i apologize uh, the variance of the dimension reduction the two components are describing the amount of variance between the two samples yes yeah okay um, I'm going to skip that. We're going to keep going. Um, later in the book, they, yeah, so they're going through PCA uh, with that. Um, different ways of calculating the dimension reduction. Um, and again, this is part of like, okay, well, which, which version of it is the best? Um, there's not necessarily a best way to do it. Again, it just comes down to trying some and seeing what best explains your data, which I know is really not helpful in terms of um, determining your expression. Um, but it really comes down to knowing what biological question you want to answer and then seeing which of these tools can best describe how you're doing this. Um, so oh. we're going to... In this case, yeah. so it, it, I mean, a typical workflow is mm -hmm. it like, it, is this typical to do clustering analysis first to kind of figure out how many groups from the data and then do something like a PCA to then further reduce with respect to those groups? Or are these kind of different approaches that one might take depending on like their personal workflow? Like if, you, if, you, if you're starting a new project, would you mm. do the steps in this order? Um, probably I would, yeah, if I didn't know what I was, if I had like a data set, I didn't know at all, like what I was gonna look at, I would probably see, especially if I didn't know the types of samples that I was working with and I just had, okay, here are some, a bunch of different cancer samples and I need to distinguish what's what, I would first wanna do clustering and then, um, and then do PCA. For the most part, um, there are sometimes I, I think with the previous example, I personally probably would have jumped straight to PCA for this just because I already knew I had five groups. Um, I probably would not have tried to change the cluster in some more unless I was specifically wanting to look at like a, if, you know, going through the data, it looked like one of the groups was acting, I'd say different or a little bit like it was like split between other groups, I probably would have wanted to take that group and then maybe try splitting that group again and then performing it. So, but yeah, typically I would start, if I didn't know how many groups ahead of time, I would first figure out how many groups I have and then start going into PCA okay. or other just dimension reduction techniques to make sense of the data. So there are other techniques. For me, it depends also a bit on the data. So for single cell data, I would usually first do dimensional reduction, so a PCA or UMAP, and then do the clustering, because then I have it already somehow in a in a two-dimensional space, and I can do the clustering and see it like directly, how which cells cluster together in this uh, space. Um, but for other kinds of data where I, where I know basically the, the samples that I have and the groups, um, I would rather do this just for quality control. So do um, uh, 
clustering and then PCA just to see if it kind of fits to what we have there. So because I know we have two different conditions or something and they should cluster together. Okay. And if they don't, or if it's like more the batches that cluster together, I already know ooh, we have a huge batch effect or something like that. <laughs> sure, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So is, is the typical expectation that like the, the PCA, like the principal components are going to map onto the clusters, right? So like your, your first principal component will primarily load on cluster one, or is it just saying, basically this gives you a new dimensionalization and then there's some other nonlinear mapping to the clusters? Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, it's fine. How, how, how it works. <laughs> it, it, I feel like, you know, potentially um, in comparison to other data types, especially when you're working with biological data, like it's not really clean cut and it really, yeah. more so that I feel like other types really depends on, on the question you're asking, as opposed to like, if I've got this financial data and I'm trying to, you know, figure out how different shopper patterns group together. Um, yeah, I guess I'm more asking. So like, I know the way a lot of people use PCA is after they run it, they'll try to identify what each component like conceptually maps to, right? And so they will say, oh, it seems like that first component is primarily an indicator of X and the second one's of Y, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is whether like here it would be that first component seems to be an indicator of that the difference between the first type of leukemia versus the other types, or if it's more that first component is giving us some kind of new complex dimension, but it's collapsing across lots and lots of other dimensions. And then we can use that to understand the clusters. If that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, yeah I see it as more of the latter. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I've also seen um, that you can really say, okay, PC1 uh, most probably is due to uh, the age of the samples and PC2 due to uh, the treatment or something like that. But then also I've seen um, in, in our biological data sometimes that you really have no clue what uh, PC1 or PC2, um, so where do they come from? That's okay. sometimes, uh, yeah. And then it's right. also hard to figure it out because uh, you don't have all the information. Yeah. So it is kind of that more pure dimension reduction. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It's right. And then I, I guess part of the later on is figuring out um, potentially with some of the supervised machine learning, like figuring out like what could be causing that differentiation between the different dimensions. Got like, it. what are the factors of doing that? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this. I want to be sure we can get through chapter five before we um, finish today, just because it is a, a pretty big chapter. Um, but this just goes into different value, different ways of doing uh, dimension reduction. There's another um, independent component analysis. Um, just other methods of doing um, dimension reduction analysis. There's several different ones. Again, on my, the YouTube channel that I keep plugging, they go into all of these. Um, and it really just comes down to what best fits the data. So I know that's not, it's not a clean gut answer, but um, yeah, those are the different um, reduction methods. Actually here, the um, TSNE uh, method. They say they try to keep the local structure of the data as opposed to just like optimizing it um, directly to another like matrix. Um, again, all just different ways to do that. Um, so going into chapter five, um, I want to. This is, you know, they've got an entire other book clubs just dedicated to supervised machine learning. So uh, I want to scroll through this pretty quickly. Um, uh, but basically, 
the supervised machine learning techniques are going to be really, really important for uh, genomics methods. So like when you can predict um, what genes are going to be expressed from what modifications, what genes are, you know, enhanced gene expression is most likely to be indicative of a disease, of a disease. Um, predicting, you know, how age affects the uh, prevalence of a particular epigenetic modification or um, activation or inactivation of a gene. So this is like really where um, the power of the machine learning comes in with this and like what we're actually trying to get with the genomic data. Um, so going into these different methods, um, I don't know how comfortable either of you are with machine learning before this is do, doing this book called the first time was my real first exposure to it um but essentially what you do is you take a small you take you know of the data you're looking at you split it and you're using about 70 percent of that data um, as your training data um, and that way you can best figure out what is going to um does that training data can you use that to get the output that you want so if you want to look at okay does how gene expression enhanced gene expression of x affects y taking some of the data you've collected taking a subset of that data using that to build the model of like okay if we have this enhancer like this level of gene expression then we can expect this amount of y effect um that would be your training data and then you can actually see how well it works to predict using the test data. So you would then, once you've built the model, you then put it on the test data. Um, so they're going into the background of that. Um, and that's basically what I described here, like getting the data normalized and cleaned. Um, you need to train, get your training data and your test data split. Um, again, training your model. Um, to build your equation, build your function for um, what you want to explain, um, and then seeing how well the model performs, and then actually picking the model. Um, here in this book, also this book um, uses base R as opposed to more of the tidy bear. So they're using the carrot package. Um, Frederica actually did a really great um, video on applying some of this in the tidy verse using tidy models. Um, and that's on the YouTube channel already, but she did a really good job um, kind of translating some of this to tidy model speak. Um, so the example that they give in the book, they want to look at um, epigenetic modifications, um, and they're trying to predict the subtype of a particular disease using um, epigenetic data. So here they've got 184 tumor samples um and they've got two data sets for this like one of the gene expressions of all the different genes they've looked at for each tumor sample and then another one of the um patient type um so this is just looking at the gene expression data um the rows are the genes and the columns are the different patient tumors um, and then the patient uh, mapped to the type of cancer that they have. Um, so this is the data that they use for this particular example. Um, so the first thing they're doing, they have to, you know, get the data normalized um, and filtered because you want to be sure, like, the NA values are removed. You want to be sure that everything is scaled accordingly. Um, so they're doing that first. Um, and then with missing values, um, depending, again, it just depends on the question that you're asking, you can either um, have the missing values imputed, or if it's just a few samples that have zeros, it may be worth discarding the samples. Um, again, it also depends on the, um, like, how frequently the missing data are, um, what would be the repercussions of imputing the data versus um, dropping the data. Um, and this is part of the process in the 
for modeling, just determining which is most reflective, what's going to give you the better data, you know, and you actually probably could, you know, you've got your clean data set, mostly clean data set, you could do one model, I mean, with, with just the imputed data, and then you could do one with the drop of data, and then you can kind of see how they compare. Um, so that's pre-processing. And then splitting the data, um, the typical split that they do is 70-30. Um, that seems to be a pretty gold standard across all machine learning techniques. So of your data, um, so with that, 30% of the data is not going to be used to create the model, and you're actually going to test your model on that split 30%. And so 70% is going to be uh, what you're using to actually train and and get an idea of like, when they say train, it's like, okay, build your, like, what is the best equation? What is the best model that fits this data that with all the different things I want to look at, what is best being described with that data? Um, and then you go to see how well it actually does on the samples that it wasn't trained on, basically the data that it wasn't used to fit the model with. Um, and for the most part, uh, you can just do it just a pretty clean 70-30 split. Um, they go into um, cross-validation and bootstrap resampling as a way to um, estimate prediction error with this. Um, so you, and that way you're taking like random samples and you're rerunning this, you know, different bootstrapping it so running it like 20 30 times with just differently randomly picked samples um to see um how much error you'd be getting from that um so that's again just a method to do that so we then go on to do unsupervised learning which we talked about in chapter that that's chapter four um so they go into the k nearest neighbors clustering algorithm you can use hierarchical clustering um so they're doing this um they also they did not go into optimize in this particular example um to the k nearest neighbor they just picked five um they you know they previously discussed how to pick the best k but that if you know if you're interested in doing that you could do all of that um k nearest neighbors first um, to determine your clustering and then go on to do the fitting. With that, um, so we need to determine whether the model is accurate or not. Um, and to do that, typically you're making a receiver operator characteristic curve, which I think is, should be down here. Um, so when you're making this, um, you're essentially getting the confusion matrix, which is what they've got up here. So, you know, your true positives and your false positives, your false positives and your true negatives. So those patients that actually have the mutation or have the disease and those that don't. Um, and then whether the model predicts it as having the disease or not having the disease accurately. Um, so we want to generate, this is the confusion matrix for this. Um, and we want to get specificity and sensitivity, or precision is um, specificity. So the sensitivity is going to be really good at classifying. So the true positives, the we'll go back up, back up. Um, precision or specificity is how accurate we um, about the competence of how accurately it is calling the disease. Like if it's calling something the disease when it actually has the disease. So in this case, it's going to be your true positives over the total amount of everything that it's calling positive, so true positives and false positives. So this is your specificity or your precision. Um, so every time you call the patient, the CMI, CIMP patient, um, if it's highly specific, that means it's actually going to be a positive. And if there's a low specificity or low precision, um, there may be more Posit false positives called when the patient actually doesn't have it. And then sensitivity is um, basically the reverse of that. How often that if there actually is um, the disease, the CIMP, and how often that we're calling it as not having CIMP. 
Um, so this is your true positives over your true positives and your false negatives. So specificity, precision going across and sensitivity going down across the major, uh, it does not let me do that, but going down. Um, it's like the sick, healthy contact. Okay, there is a difference between precision and specificity. Specificity is, okay, so I apologize earlier. I was saying that precision and specificity were the same thing. And that's not, it's the true negatives. Um, specificity is like how often we call something that's negative, is it truly negative? Precision is when it's positive, how often is it truly positive? And then sensitivity is how often does a false positive get called? Um, so a highly sensitive model will be good at classifying sick people when they are indeed sick. Um, yeah. So the just to, to point out the the book itself is actually their tables labeled wrong. Oh, it is. Yeah. So if you scroll okay. up to their table, that that bottom false positives mm -hmm. should be false negatives. Because what that is, is it's someone who, it, and it, like they're, they, they say FN, so they get that part right. They just put yeah, the wrong yeah. word. But got just it, to make sure it's clear. So what that's saying is that someone who was predicted to not have SIMP, but actually does. As and so that's where um, sensitivity comes in. So what sensitivity is telling us is of those that um, are true, that, that, that were predicted to be positives, um, versus the total number that actually are positive. So basically it's a, like, how many did we miss? Yes, exactly. Of the true, of the people that are actually positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you, Keith. Yeah, um, no, I just noticed and I was like, that, that's something that seems, seems weird. Yeah, 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 I was like, I don't know what is, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so essentially, but this confusion matrix is what allows us to generate the specificity and the sensitivity, the precision, and all of that is used to create um, an ROC, um, so receiver operator characteristics curve. Um, and that's down here. Um, and so the ROC curve, um, the x-axis is one minus the specificity. And then the y-axis is uh, the sensitivity of the data. Um, and the essentially the smoother this curve is um you know if it's jagged you typically don't have enough points but here like it's pretty smooth and this this inflection point you know like the area under the curve here is actually what you're um getting at so this the roc here the 0.796 so this is um 976 excuse me um this would be a pretty accurate model you've got pretty high you know pretty high specificity and also pretty high sensitivity also um and the closer this value is to one um the more uh the the better it's fit essentially um going into model tuning um so something with training data you don't want to overfit the model you don't actually want it to be perfect because when you then apply it to your test data um there may be discrepancies because it's fit so well to just the training data and if you're trying to optimize every little parameter it won't take in um especially when you've got data that's not that particular data set um if the model is over tuned to the training data with the test data if it looks different it's going to give essentially like worse it's going to look like it wasn't as effective and so you want to um check to be sure that when you are making your data, uh, doing your training, uh, that it's not overfit. Um, and so here they're going through, um, and they're like, how did you know you picked the best K? Like, well, you just check different Ks and you check how well the model is. Um, so you're training all these different Ks um, and your training error as your K value increases. Um, you know, it starts to increase pretty dramatically. And so really the optimal number of Ks here, um, four is actually pretty high, five and six um, give kind of a reflection point of low, relatively low error 
um, but also enough detail to just to break down different subtypes within the tumor samples. Um, so that's making all of this um, here when they actually ran this on the test data also when they ran this um, they did this here with the, the training error, um, the prediction error. They ran this again with the training data. Um, and I mean, with the test data, so they actually went to see how well it, it looked. Um, and ideally you would have wanted the training data and the test data to kind of mirror one another. And the, the points where they actually, this is where it starts getting confusing again. Um, so essentially, um, so the training data is always going to be better fit than test data, just about, yeah. because it's, it fits that. So like in this case, I think they're saying that the, if they had chosen a K of five, it would have turned out to be really effective because that's also where the test data error is minimized. Um, so it's basically, it's just kind of saying that the, the training data selection criteria may have been effective because it got to a good fit for the test data. Right, right. Because like the, the difference between the test data and the training data, this is like the, the low, like the distance yeah. between that is the smallest. Well, it's not necessarily the distance, right? Because you could have a small distance, but they both have lots of error. It's that in both of them, the error is low, right? right. So relative to the other test the, the other values, um, the other error values for test set with different Ks, the error is lowest for a K of five. Yeah. And so that says, you know, the relative amount of error with that K seems to be really effective. Right, right. Um, and then like compared to that, like also like 11 Ks where you've got a higher, like the training data had a higher, it compared that to like, okay, like with this K of 11 here, mm -hmm. that the training data, relatively speaking, had a high K, but like, you know, in comparison, oh, there's not that much difference between the training and the the test data and the training data. However, but because this is already higher, that right. we don't want to necessarily use that. We want a lower, the, the best combination of like lowest training, lowest test. Kind of. So, I mean, so yeah. typically what you would do in this is you would make your decision before you've applied it to the test data. Okay. So it, it like, in most machine learning approaches, you wouldn't ever have this plot because you wouldn't run the other uh, parameter values on the, on the test set. Mm -hmm. So you can do things like, if you do like cross-validation and bootstrapping, you get something like this with the cross-validated sets, although even then you usually would just say, take the average error um, with like the validation set. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this is, this is really, I think more just, to, you know, at a, kind of uh, pedagogical level for showing how this operates to show when they used the, um, their training approach to do parameter selection, it worked essentially. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, and so there's always, you know, like what's the trade-off between having the best fitting model and the variance and bias and it really you want it optimized where you've got um relatively low error but not like a you know moderately complex not overly complex um and minimal variance you kind of want this at that inflection point um and I, this is also just showing like when you've got the k nearest neighbors um like the variance between the two different um when you've got the clusters, like the two clusters clearly don't describe the data cleanly enough, but when you've got 12, um, bit more of a cleaner um, boundary between the two. However, you know, if we did this and they also had five, you know, it may have been even smoother. Um, so again, training, validation, tests, different, like the, the different strategies doing the cross validation um, with this, this is all for the Ks. Um, they go into variable importance. Um, I don't know entirely what that was doing. Oh, um, like how the different, um, like are different variables going to affect 
your data um, and you can do that with you know calculating ROC curves or creating ROC curves and then calculating the AUC out here into the curve um, but this is that's all kind of more for parameter tuning as opposed to um, just going kind of brute force with it um class imbalance um, um so that, sorry yes i'm just uh, i will have to leave soon um i will just then finish watching the video or i don't know because you said you want to finish this today right yeah we might so i ha we have this on youtube the yeah. we went through right. chapter five so i think it probably we, we could just finish it up um with this because i do want to start getting into the actual genomics data yeah so i think if we could start into chapter six next week with that right. yeah because i they honestly their youtube tutorials are explaining this way better than i can i'm still like actively learning the machine learning side of things mm -hmm. um myself but i think actually getting into like actually like using bioconductor and creating the types of objects i think that's going to be the most useful yeah yeah um yeah so i guess with that so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen um but the the sign up for i guess like how do we want to break down to start presenting what i don't think we're going to get all through chapter six mm. um they're pretty they're pretty meaty chapters um do we want to you know i could maybe start some on chapter six for next week um and then see how far we get and we'll just pick it up from there and we can kind of rotate through. Yeah. Okay. That'd be good for me. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, y'all. I uh, thank you for um, listening to my fumbling through my. Uh, <laughs> Great. Thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I'll see y'all next week. Yeah. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye.